Tuesday, December 28th, 2021, Maneco 64, home of alternative economics and contrarian views. We're going to look at a couple of things today, but mainly we're going to look at the long-term technical picture for gold and silver and whether 2022 will be the year where we see a breakout of some massive teacup and handle formations uh, in gold and silver. Uh, the silver teacup formation has been building uh, for 40 years. Uh, the gold teacup formation has been building for 10 years. Uh, before we go into that, though, we're going to look at uh, an announcement made by Goldman Sachs yesterday. Goldman Sachs, of course, is one of the major financial institutions on the planet. They've been behind the U.S. government, the U.S. Treasury for decades. Yes, BlackRock is important, but I would say Goldman Sachs is even more important. Many of you might remember an article by Matt Taibbi of Rolling Stone uh, that uh, called Goldman Sachs the vampire squid. How Goldman Sachs has been manipulating markets and luring uh, investors <laughs> in, into shady deals since the 1920s and the Great Depression. And, and many of you probably uh, have seen The Big Short. And Goldman Sachs is a big part of that movie. I recommend you watch that. Uh, Goldman Sachs uh, was one of the investment banks that, that wrote the credit default swaps for Professor or Dr. Michael Burry. Uh, uh, <laughs> and uh, you will see how they treated him. And that's the kind of people uh, they are, Goldman Sachs. I remember uh, in the city, when I worked in the city, uh, one of my colleagues, one of uh, his big clients, European corporate, came to visit us. And we, we took him out for dinner and we were speaking with them. And they were telling us that they had been to Goldman Sachs earlier in the day. <laughs> and when we were leaving the dinner, I said, be careful with Goldman Sachs. They're crooks. <laughs> and I said it like that. I didn't hold any punches because it wasn't really my client. And we're just talking. And this was before the OA crisis. And the guy looked at me and said, what are you talking about? Well, they have a past Goldman Sachs. And lo and behold, what happened in 08, they were a big part of it. Uh, Blank Fine had to testify uh, in Congress, of course. Uh, they weren't punished. <laughs> they became even more powerful, I would say, uh, a few years later. They even had another Secretary of the Treasury, uh, Steve Mnuchin, <laughs> under President Trump. But uh, yesterday they announced that, uh, let's see here, the announcement. Uh, yeah, Goldman Sachs will require U.S. employees to get booster shots. I think that's from February. And it also says Goldman Sachs plans to require COVID boosters and mandates twice weekly testing. Why am I not surprised they're doing that? Well, because as I've said, they've been uh, in charge of economic or political, in charge of the United States, I would say, very influential. Ever since Robert Rubin, and who's Robert Rubin? Well, he used to be the, the head of uh, Goldman Sachs before Goldman Sachs went public, of course, I think 90, 1999 or thereabouts. Uh, he used to work with Jeff Christian <laughs> at a firm called J. Aaron, which became part of Goldman Sachs. They, they were precious metals dealer. That's Robert Rubin's background. And he became Secretary of the Treasury under uh, President Clinton from January 1995 to July 1999. And then he was replaced by Larry Summers, of course, uh, from 1999 to 2001. We know a lot about Larry Summers. Um, and of course, Robert Rubin became, became a chairman. He had a special post as well at, at Citigroup. Um, and then 
Citigroup was bailed out in 08. Um, but uh, the thing is, I would say Goldman Sachs and Robert Rubin, they were instrumental in, in manipulating the price of gold from the mid 90s to the early 2000s. And I think Larry Summers was part of that as well. Larry Summers uh, wrote a very interesting uh, piece of uh, analysis called Gibson's Paradox, where he talks about uh, interest rates and the price of gold. And, and, and I think this is one of the reasons why Larry Summers uh, came to the Treasury after uh, Rubin uh, left in 99, because he knew uh, about gold and, and how uh, they had to manipulate it. And I would say that Goldman Sachs was instrumental and other uh, bullion banks as well in helping the Treasury keep the price of gold down in the mid to late 90s. Uh, and that's what triggered, of course, the dot-com uh, bubble, the internet bubble. It, of course, ended in disaster for investors, many investors. And one of the ways that uh, they went about manipulating gold is through leasing or hypothecating uh, physical gold and selling it many times over. Uh, th that's what they did. So Robert Rubin was instrumental in that. And, and uh, Goldman Sachs as well has been uh, involved with government, central banks, for many decades, uh, just to name a few, uh, in Italy they've been they've become people who worked for Goldman Sachs have become prime ministers, as we know right now, Mario Draghi. But prior to that, we had uh, Mario Monti, we had uh, Romano Prodi. Uh, in Ireland, we had a guy called uh, Peter Sutherland, who worked for Goldman Sachs. He he was very influential. You can see him here. Uh, in 1997, in a photo with Larry Summers, who was at the time the de deputy uh, treasury secretary. So yeah, Larry Summers uh, was also involved with Rubin when Rubin was secretary of the treasury. He was his deputy. And, and uh, this photo is not surprising that, that there are at the World Economic Forum, the people who are pushing uh, the policy these days, the Great Reset working together with Bill Gates. So that's why I'm not surprised about this. Goldman Sachs, they're playing right along where they're setting the policy. Who else have we got Goldman Sachs? Well, we've got uh, Mark Carney, who became governor of the Bank of England. Mark Carney is uh, the man behind uh, the climate change agenda for the bankers and the World Economic Forum. He's even on the board now of the World Economic Forum. So yes, I forgot Hank Paulson. Hank Paulson came from Goldman Sachs uh, in 2006 to become Secretary of the Treasury for George W. Bush. Just when things were unraveling so that he could make sure that uh, the whole of Wall Street and Goldman Sachs were saved by, by us, the taxpayer. Yes, <laughs> and... In 2008 as well, Goldman Sachs was saved by the Federal Reserve. And how did they do that? Well, overnight, they allowed Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley as well to uh, become bank holding companies. <laughs> Up until then, they were investment banks. And what, how did that help uh, Goldman Sachs? Well, because they're probably going to collapse. And this decision was in September of 2008 when things were unraveling. So what that did by them becoming a, a traditional bank holding company is that they could uh, borrow uh, funds from the Federal Reserve at, at, the, at the discount window. So they saved themselves there. Also the bailout, of course, uh, of AIG. Uh, made sure that Goldman Sachs was made whole on the, uh, on the investments they had made with AIG financial products. So 
just wanted to put that through there before we look at uh, gold and silver in the teacup. And before I look at the, the teacups, the very long term teacups in gold is about 10 years in silver is a 40 year teacup. I, I want to look at a teacup uh, that uh, I, I was following back around 2004. Uh, just a couple of years after I started buying gold. And at that time, I was already following uh, JS Mindset or Jim Sinclair's uh, blog. And he was the first one uh, that indicated uh, uh, as to the formation of this teacup. I had never heard of a teacup formation. And by then, I'd been working in the markets for over 15 years. I had done technical analysis courses uh, back in the 90s. Uh, I was really into technical analysis and I'm still, I still am. I'm also into fundamentals, but we're going to look at the technicals here. So you can see here there's a, a teacup being formed from 1996 to around 2004. And it's interesting that gold dropped so much from the mid 90s to the uh, late, to, late 90s and, you know, uh, I would say early 2000s. That was the period where Rubin and Summers were in charge. Summers, who, who penned the article Gibson's Paradox on how uh, gold uh, and interest rates were related. And they basically um, <laughs> negated that paradox by doing what they did, by manipulating the gold price. But anyway, there's the teacup. And it took, I guess, eight years uh, to evolve. And eventually, uh, we broke the handle there. It went up above 450, as you can see, uh, retested, came back down, tested a few times. But it only really started moving gold uh, just before 2006. So that's the other thing I have to say. And I've fallen victim to this. Uh, and this happens not just in markets, but in life as well, I would say. Uh, we expect things to happen like tomorrow. <laughs> and uh, that's why uh, patience is such an important thing. And I think it's one of the comments by uh, John Maynard Keynes. And I'm not a Keynesian, but one thing he said that is very appropriate and why leverage is dangerous is that uh, markets can remain irrational for uh, longer that you can longer than you can remain solvent, and that's why I tell people to always be careful with their leverage because things don't happen exactly as you foresee them. So there you go. That so the the premises of the teacup and handle formation, and some people might argue that a teacup signifies markets that are kept down, maybe by manipulation, and it could be, but uh, the way to s extrapolate or what it means is that once we break the top of the teacup, uh, the market will go up the distance from the bottom of the teacup at the middle of the, from the bottom to the top of the teacup. So you take uh, that measurement and you put it on top of the teacup, or you could put it uh, from where the teacup is broken, it's debatable where you put it. But as you can see, once we broke the top of that teacup uh, for good uh, in around uh, August 2005, gold uh, went up almost in a straight line. Of course, it took a while and we uh, went up above 700 to around 730 by uh, May 2006. So it took a while. It took about six, seven months and even a little longer from the break of the, uh, the handle. So the, these formations are not, they don't happen right away. So that's the original teacup that uh, in gold that I remember really well. So let's go to the uh, current gold teacup uh, and handle formation. Have a look at that. Um, let's have a look at that. So as you can see here, I, I've drawn it 
on a weekly chart here from my IG.com um, dealing platform. And as you can see, uh, this teacup uh, and handle formation has been formed uh, from 2011 to, well, to right now, 2021. So it's a 10 year teacup and handle, fairly similar to the teacup and handle back from 96 to around 2004, five, six. So about 10 years. Uh, this one is a little different because the, the cup is slanted upwards, which in my opinion means it's uh, quite a bullish formation. Uh, if it was slanted downwards, it probably wouldn't be as bullish. And as you can see here, uh, it, we try to break out of that teacup handle, uh, let's see, back in uh, November, just last month, and, and the market reversed quite quickly, and we tested, we went right back down to retest uh, the bottom of the handle, as you can see, and right now, it looks like we're trying to break out again of that handle. That handle, as you can see, ends sometime next year, or so is it guaranteed we're going to break out of the handle right now? Not really, but I think we're close. So the objective of this teacup would be the bottom from uh, 2015, which is 1,045, and now to the top of the teacup, which is around 2,000. Uh, so you do the maths. I did the maths, uh, and I got around... 2750 and that's not taking the top of the teacup that's taking uh where we are pretty much right now because it looks like we're breaking the handle i've taken it from the handle i've been more conservative but it could be more or less who knows but it's thereabouts 2750 and when could that uh happen <laughs> as i said uh we need to be careful about expecting things to happen too quickly as as you saw there it took a while it took six to eight even 12 months for gold to go from around four 420 and i think at the time it was 430 the top of the teacup if i remember well it, it took a while but it went to 730 it, it, it went up 300 dollars in very short order so Yes, maybe in 2022, we're going to see a, a move towards the objective of this teacup. Who knows? So, and now to the silver teacup. The silver teacup, of course, is a 40-year teacup. Uh, as you can see, there's the top in uh, January 1980, just under $50, and the top in 2011, also around $50. It's a perfect teacup, I would say. And I would say we've broken uh, the handle already. <laughs> Last year, we retested the handle, as you can see, and now it's breaking out again, but it's a very long-term teacup. Right now, it feels that silver is doing nothing, but I would say longer term, it is. But uh, I mean, I haven't really bothered to measure that because I think it's not very significant. I, I think uh, this teacup signifies that silver has been kept under control for 40 years. And once it breaks through that 50 level, which is the top of the teacup in, in this uh, particular example, I know the gold teacup is breaking uh, the handle right now. Uh, but I think silver will really only start motoring uh, massively <laughs> when it breaks the top of the teacup. Not to say that once we break 30, silver won't accelerate here. I'm not going to make any forecasts for silver, but uh, I would say if uh, gold does get to 2750, let's say the gold silver ratio drops to 50, that would mean silver around 55. Uh, I have a feeling it could be a lot higher. Um, and this is not financial advice here. I'm just giving you my opinion of the technical picture. And as I've said, this could take longer uh, than we expect. And that's why, uh, 
yeah, leveraging is very dangerous uh, when you uh, when you uh, speculate in the markets. Of course, uh, I don't have leverage positions in gold and silver or bullion. I do have, I guess, position uh, positions in the, in the gold and silver miners, and that's like being leveraged. But I, I'm not leveraged those positions, so I haven't borrowed uh, to to uh, buy my miners. And uh, so, yeah, that's the way I see gold and silver. We need to be patient. And uh, before we look at the markets this morning, I wanted to recommend you uh, a YouTube channel that I think uh, is very good, especially uh, for those of you who are more into trading. And it's called Finding Value Finance. Uh, he's a really good... Uh, analyst. His name is Andy. And recently, uh, I think it was premiered December 25th, Christmas Day. Uh, and it's a great uh, technical uh, uh, analysis video. And, and I could have done the same thing as he did, but I, I thought he did a great job. So I'm going to recommend you watch uh, this video. It's called, uh, the title is The Once in a Lifetime Trades in Commodities the setup uh it's about nine minutes long so a lot shorter than my my video but uh, uh highly recommended and, and it kind of corresponds with what, what i'm seeing for gold and silver and other commodities as well of course so i'm gonna put it up in the cards and in the description of this video and uh i recommend you uh, subscribe to his channel if you're interested so now let's look at uh, where the markets are this morning. Uh, it's 10 past 9 a.m. London time. So we've got spot gold at 18.15. It's up about $3. The high's been 18.16 and the low 18.08. So yes, we're breaking above that weekly trend line, which is basically the top of the teacup handle. Uh, am I saying we're gonna go up straight away now? No, but it, it looks in, it looks interesting and positive. Um, spot silver is unchanged, twenty three oh six. Range has been twenty three fifteen and twenty two ninety five. The Dow futures up fifty two points. Uh, Nasdaq one hundred futures up almost half a percent. So it does look like. That crack up runaway boom is continuing. Uh, uh, the, the Federal Reserve said they're going to start tapering, but their balance sheet is continuing to increase. And we're going to update the balance sheet hopefully soon. Um, yes, they're still increasing their balance sheet, not decreasing it. Uh, or they're not, they're still, they're, even when they taper, they're, they're, they're going to increase it. But the rate at which they're increasing doesn't show that they're tapering. So I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Uh, S&P 500 futures up seven points. To the currencies, uh, well, we got sterling uh, unchanged, 134.37. The euro is down slightly, 113.26. Dollar is uh, down slightly versus the yen, 114.80. And uh, yeah, the dollar is down slightly as well versus the U1, 637.35. Fairly quiet, I would say, the FX market. Uh, Aussie dollar is unchanged, 72.39. The dollar is uh, up slightly versus the, the loonie or Canadian at 128. And the Kiwi dollar is down slightly at 68.06. To the commodities, uh, WTI crude is uh, <laughs> rebounding very strongly here. Uh, it's at 75.82. Uh, just wanted to show you this chart here of WTI crude. Uh, I think this uh, level just above 77 is going to be very important. If, if we break through 77 and trade towards eight, towards 80, um, it means that uh, we might have negated the formation of a head, head and shoulder top, as you can see here. So uh, crude starting to look very positive. Um, High grade copper uh, is, is down half a percent, 
but it's at 444. So uh, we've moved up quite a bit from recent levels around 430. Uh, natural gas, U.S. natural gas trading just below four. I saw that European natural gas prices have dropped in the last few days. <laughs> uh, uh, Europe has had to resort to uh, importing uh, LNG gas from the United States. So there's a lot of LNG tankers coming across the Atlantic to help Europe <laughs> with its energy crisis and the weather has become a little milder, that's helped prices. I don't think we are out of the woods yet though, in terms of um, the energy crisis, unfortunately. So just to finish off, let's quickly look at the uh, 10 year yield here. Uh, US 10 year yield uh, is at 1.47%. So very quiet things are in the bond markets right now. So. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you hit the like button. Please share it far and wide. Think about subscribing to my channel if you haven't yet. And you can also follow me on Rumble, Twitter, Facebook, and all these other platforms below here. I wish you all a great day. Take care. Bye.